Well, brothers and sisters, this being the fourth Sunday of our Advent season, we know that Christmas Day, the blessed nativity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that day is so close. And to be exact, using technical language, we are six sleeps away from the big day. And this is exciting. This joyous Christmas season is right around the corner. But, you know, just to reflect back on Christmases that have come and gone, thinking back, you know, can we honestly say that this time of year is unfailingly joyous and satisfying and somewhat restful? If you do, that's wonderful. It really is. But for a lot of people, and I include my, myself in this group, for a lot of people, there are these extremely high expectations and pressures that either we place on ourselves or that the world places on us, or a combination of both, flavored with the sinister influence of Satan himself, expectations which must be met for you and me to have truly a worthwhile and satisfying Christmas season. We can have it in our minds that there is this whole long inescapable checklist, and if we don't check off every single box on that checklist, then the season will be kind of a failure and a source of melancholy. Got to see all these people. Got to buy all these gifts. Got to indulge in all the popular foods and entertainment programs that everyone else is indulging in. Got to make sure not to spend too much money. Then again, can't be seen as a Scrooge. Got to maximize every single last moment of the holiday. Got to minimize time spent at places where we'd rather not be and got to keep my, our, my finger on the pulse of the popular culture. If it's not there, I'll be out of the loop, and that's socially unacceptable. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. Now, again, brothers and sisters, if you're immune to the power of the checklist, praise God, <laughs> praise God, but you're certainly not among the majority. And friends, these checklists can be so powerful. And the items and events and obligations on these lists may not necessarily be bad, but the items and the schedules can dominate our lives if we're not careful. I mean absolutely dominate throughout the year and especially during the upcoming season of Christmas. And yes, for sure, you know, we're called to rejoice during this festive period as we celebrate the arrival of our blessed Lord Jesus, and how easy it is to forget that only, only our Lord can satisfy the longing in our hearts to experience the fullness of life, the fullness of what we're really pursuing. Only Jesus can ultimately satisfy our desire and everyone's desire for that true belonging, that authentic recognition that lasting fulfillment, only when we're relishing in his presence, attuned to his love for us, and prayerfully abiding in Jesus, can this happen. Now, I mean, all those worldly checklists can quite literally take possession of our hearts. But we're meant to be our Lord's. Our hearts are meant to be Jesus' possession so that we and then others around us can truly have that fullness of life. Friends, in our gospel today, we hear these two remarkable women, and they're rejoicing together. And not because they've successfully checked off a hundred boxes on their checklists. No, their, their simple but radiant joy is rooted in their closeness with the one who loved them into existence, who loved them from day one and who never stopped loving them. In this gospel scene, Mary, our blessed mother, visits her cousin Elizabeth. They are both with child. And Elizabeth, we know she's been barren for most of her life, and now there she is, six months pregnant when Mary comes to see her. Now let's just rewind a bit and ask the question. Throughout Elizabeth, throughout her life, all those times that she and Zachariah failed to conceive a child. Did God not love them? No, of, of course he loved them. Their lack of ability to conceive for the longest time 
was not a curse. It was not divine punishment. It was rather Elizabeth and Zachariah's particular path to grow closer to God, their God and our God, who will never be outdone in generosity. This, this path they were asked to travel, this path was a gift, even though at times it must have been difficult to really see as a gift. God, he never stopped loving this couple, and he never stopped inviting them into a, this deeper relationship with him over the course of their pilgrim journey. And then what happens near the end of their pilgrimage? Well, in very dramatic fashion, Elizabeth and Zachariah are able to conceive despite their advanced age. And not too long after, we arrive here in this gospel scene. There's Elizabeth, six months pregnant with pre-born John the Baptist resting inside her. And no doubt, Elizabeth was overjoyed and grateful, to say the least, for this gift of life that dwelt in her womb. But what is Elizabeth most grateful for? And what is little six-month-old John excited about in this passage? <laughs> they are thrilled about the two guests who show up. Now Mary, in the scene just before this one, Mary boldly consented to be the mother of the Son of God. And at that moment, the power of the Holy Spirit descends. Jesus is conceived in her womb. Then after hearing from the angel Gabriel of the news of Elizabeth's motherhood, young Mary, around 14 years old or so, she joyously goes in haste to the hill country of Judea to see her cousin Elizabeth. Mary, the new ark of the new covenant traveling forth, the new ark of the new covenant in whom dwells the very incarnate presence of God. And as we hear when Mary and very young Jesus arrive at Elizabeth and Zachariah's house, little six-month-old John leaps. He leaps in Elizabeth's womb. John dances, if you will, just like how King David danced before the Ark of the Covenant a thousand years before this scene in the very same hill country of Judah. Now is John. John dances, and he alerts his mother to the presence of the King of Kings who dwells in Mary's womb. Elizabeth is then propelled forth, and she expresses her gratitude directed to the Christ child, who is not visible to her eye. And notice this. At this moment, Elizabeth, she doesn't say to Mary, hey, check it out. I finally accomplished that goal of getting pregnant. You should be happy for me. No, Elizabeth doesn't, doesn't focus on any checklist box that had been successfully checked off. No, Elizabeth does not draw attention to herself whatsoever. Because of little John, Elizabeth is drawn to rejoice in the Lord's presence, the one who had been inviting her in Zechariah into deeper and holier levels of intimacy with him through their, throughout their lives. And now he's right in front of her. He's right there. And Elizabeth exclaims to Mary, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And friends, this, this wasn't a solemn whisper. This was this exclamation of joy. That was a product, brothers and sisters. That was, was a result of a journey of steady reliance on God. A journey of growing in faith. Growing clo in closeness with him. And this action, this response, showcased so beautifully by St. Elizabeth, it's for us, especially in this season of hustle and bustle as it continues just to ramp up. Friends, we know no amount of food consumed will give us this kind of joy. No Boxing Day sale at the Coquitlam Center or Metro Town will give us this kind of joy. No amount of earthly treasures or friendly associations give us this kind of joy. Now, do we have to reject good food, good sales, good material items, good healthy relationships? No, not at all. But if we take our deepest questions like, am I worthy of love? Or will you recognize me eternally? Or will I ever be truly satisfied, truly ultimately happy? 
if we take these very deep questions to our checklists and to the items and events on our checklists, the answers we receive will be totally unsatisfying. Brothers and sisters, we know it's time, it's time of year, our Lord advances. He advances toward our territory with our Blessed Mother. Our Lord advances to where we are, wherever we are, in whatever state our hearts are in. He advances toward you personally. He goes the distance to meet us where we're at. And so as we enter into this Holy Eucharist and as we await highly anticipated Christmas season, let us again respond in faith and prayerfully rejoice as our Lord advances. Our Lord who loved us into existence, who loved us from day one and who never stops loving us. Let us respond in faith and advance towards him. Our Lady of Good Counsel, pray for us. Saint Elizabeth, pray for us. Saint John the Baptist, pray for us.